Tá no ritmo. Everybody, it's good to have you back at Mesa Baptist Church tonight. We're glad you chose to worship with us this evening. If you're here in person, we're glad you're here. Let's all stand if we can. Number 329. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Let's all stand. Number 329 on that first verse. I was lost in sin, but Jesus rescued me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was bound by fear, but Jesus set me free. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a friend so true, so patient and so kind. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Everything I need, in Him I always find. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Are you ready? For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me on this last. Dearer grows the love of Jesus day by day. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Sweeter is His grace while pressing on my way. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Amen. Great singing. Let's go to head number 427. Number 427. My anchor holds number 427 on this first verse. Nice and lively this evening. Though the angry surges roll on my tempest-driven soul, 
I am peaceful for I know Wildly though the winds may blow I've an anchor safe and sure That can never more endure And it holds my anchor holds Blow your wildest then, O oh gale On my bark so small and frail By his grace I shall not fail For my anchor holds My anchor holds Mighty tides about me sweep Pearls lurk within the deep Angry clouds or shade the sky, and the tempest rises high. Still I stand the tempest shock, for my anchor grips the rock, and it holds my anchor holds. Blow your wildest and O oh gale, on my bark so small and frail. By his grace I shall not fail, for my anchor holds, my anchor holds. Let's get around and shake some hands tonight as the instruments play. seats number 427 tonight on this last verse when you find your place join us on that verse number 427 on the last troubles almost whelm the soul grief like billows o'er me roll tempter seek to lure us stray storms obscure the light of day but in Christ I can be bold, I've an anchor that shall hold, and it holds, my anchor holds, blow your wildest and O oh gale, on my bark so small and frail, by his grace I shall not fail, for my anchor holds, my anchor Amen. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Sure is good to see you tonight. Anybody have a blessing this week? Miss Ann? Got a clean bill of health. No more skin cancers. Amen. That's good news. That's great. All right. Anybody else tonight? I had a blessing this week. Brother Kenny? Uh, I talked to my dad today at New place of Missouri. He's off of his walker. He's only on his cane. And at home, he doesn't use a cane at all. So he's doing really well recovering. He's making good progress. Amen. Yeah, there's something about those Florida boys. We're really tough. Amen. So, uh, yeah, I need to give your dad a call. It's been a while since I talked to him. That's a, that's good. Anybody else have a blessing? Miss Lori? I sent my dad home on Sunday, and he had the, the heart monitor uh, uh, follow-up appointment yesterday, I think it was. And they, they said it was good. Amen. That's good news. That's answer to prayer. Got time for one more. Anybody else? Miss Miss Harvetta. 
Mitch is getting better. Yes, we've been praying for him, too. That's good news. Brother Ted's back tonight. And uh, how many of you missed him Sunday? Yeah, I, I can tell when he's not here because what, what was that song we sing? You always shout amen on. So, yeah, I had to do it for you. OK, so yeah, you, you can't miss those Sundays. We sing those songs. OK. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and have a seat tonight and uh, look on your prayer time. Hopefully you got one when you came in. If you need one, raise your hand and uh, we'll have one of the ushers bring one to you. Anybody need a prayer time? Okay. Uh, our attendance was down again Sunday and uh, I think we're just seeing some summer slump going on. They've got people out of town on vacation and as far as I know, they plan to come back. And so, uh, you know, I, I was talking to Stephen Giordano this week and he said that there's more Americans traveling this summer than ever before. Now, why do you think that is? They've been shut down for a year. Amen. And uh, so they're getting out and about. And I think that's good. And uh, so we got a lot of people, I'm sure. And we had a good offering Sunday, um, that forty five hundred dollars for the frontline teens. Uh, that was from um, uh, the teen camp money uh, that, that was paid. Uh, we paid the bill. And then, you know, the other churches there, they they reimburse us. So that's where that forty five hundred dollars came from. But we had a good offering Sunday. Uh, mark on your calendar, Sunday, August 29th. Uh, I'm sorry, that should be August 1st. OK, change that to August 1st. And uh, my mistake, August 1st, not the 29th. August 1st is uh, our church's anniversary, 41st anniversary, my 38th anniversary. Why is it? It's not a big deal unless it ends in a zero five. You ever notice that? Isn't that true with like wedding anniversaries? Yeah. You know, it's only zeros and fives, but it's a big deal. Amen. 41 years. And uh, God's really blessed us. Uh, the Appreciation Day is August 29th, Police Appreciation Day. And uh, we're slowly getting that together. We finally figured out what type of gift to give to the officers. Uh, we still need more volunteers. We still need more gift cards. And so be much in prayer for the Appreciation Day. Uh, mentioned Sunday night, one thing I'm concerned about, we have a bunch of new officers. They either have come out of the academy or they have lateraled over from other departments. And uh, I don't know them. They don't know me. They've not been to our appreciation day. And um, so we're putting on a blitz to get the information out. And uh, hopefully we'll see a good response from them. And so pray with us, if you would, about that. Uh, men, don't forget our, our men's Bible study breakfast this Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. We're going to have chicken and waffles, okay? And uh, so get here on time. We'll feed you good and uh, bring a friend. We've been running about between 25 and 30. And uh, I like to see us get over that 30 mark. So plan to be here for that. And uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers, his teaching has just been fantastic. It's been really great for us. And so uh, plan to be here for that at 8 o'clock. It's time well spent. OK, also on the prayer list tonight, continue praying for Brother Ken Rawpaw. And uh, Sherry passed away last week, so pray for him, for God's peace and comfort. And then uh, when I talked to Stephen uh, yesterday, uh, he said Amy is having more good days than bad. And uh, they've already scheduled her next surgery to go in and remove more of these tumors out of her abdomen. And that surgery is scheduled for August the 24th, okay? And so he says she's kind of depressed about that because she's, what, been through three major surgeries so far, and she's got two more to go. Uh, they've got to take the tumors out, and then they've got to go back and replace that heart valve that they just put in. And But they said the doctor's saying after that, uh, you know, uh, she should be on the road to recovery. And so he's pushing 2022 is going to be a her best year. Okay. So continue to pray for her. He did say she went to church Sunday night. She went to go to the church and Monday she was wiped out. I mean, it just took a whole lot of strength. And so, uh, if you know, Miss Amy, she was, uh, you know, just real bubbly and, and active and to, for her to be in this situation just tells us how bad her condition is. And then I got a, uh, uh, an email from brother Jeff Lang missionary to Thailand today. And, uh, he has been diagnosed with testicular cancer. OK, so uh, they're going to be doing some more tests to see if it's spread. Uh, he said he's in a high risk group because of some previous illnesses he's had. And so if you would lift him up in prayer, hopefully uh, they caught it in time. Amen. 
and uh, it's just really bad. And and uh, he's such a good guy, doing such a great job. You know, he's supposed to go to what was it, Liberia? Liberia. Yeah, and uh, help with church planning there. And uh, I'm sure that's off the table. And then he's wanting to help us uh, uh, with a uh, Bible study outreach through Facebook. He knows how to set all that up and get it working. And uh, I think I have a lady, I haven't talked to her yet about taking care of that, working it for us. So, uh, but do pray for Brother Jeff Lang. I know he'd appreciate that so much. And he's got what, two kids, I think, two or three kids. Three. And uh, the oldest is, uh, I think, about to go into the military. Okay. He's, I think he's, no, he's going to Bible college, but he's, he's doing reserve. Okay. Is what he's doing. He's going to school up in Fargo. Okay. Any additional prayer requests tonight? Miss Dawn? For Bobby Coriel, just for her health. She hasn't been doing very well. So. Yeah, let's keep praying for Bobby and also uh, Pamela Baker. They both struggle with this lupus and all these other things. Be thankful if you have good health. Amen. Take it for granted. Brother Charles? Uh, my aunt Brenda is. Uh, uh, was rushed to the hospital yesterday or this morning, and uh, she they found out that she has two clogged arteries going to her heart. Okay. And one's ninety percent closed, the other one's fifty percent closed. So she needs a prayer because her heart is weak. Uh, so they can't really do the surgery right now. Uh, because they need, they need to do, put some sticks in there. To go yeah, I need to do a bypass, get around that. But let's pray for her. Aunt Brenda, Charles' Aunt Brenda. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm still not doing real well. And I told the doctor this morning, and he referred me to a general surgeon this next week. Okay. Let's pray for Vonna. This is Chris Holder's mom. She's had some medical issues. Okay. Yeah, they, they came one time for a visit, and they've been back every service since, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they, they got infected, amen? They got the Mesa bug, okay. Anybody else before we go to the next song? Brother Charles? Uh, my son-in-law, Jim, uh, he, got, he had surgery this morning to, for gastric bypass. He's got to stay in the hospital. He seems to be doing better. Okay, what type of bypass? Gastric, gastric, bypass. gastric bypass. Okay. Okay. Let's pray for Jim. Dawn had that too, didn't she? Yeah. yeah. She lost a lot of weight doing that. And she's expecting again. Yeah. yeah. All righty. There's nobody else. Brother Kenny. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Let's all stand one more time tonight. Number 509 in our songbooks. Make me a blessing to someone today. Number 509, all three verses tonight. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Tell the sweet story of Christ and His love. Tell of His power to forgive. Others will trust Him if only you prove true every moment you live. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine, make me a blessing, O oh, Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing 
to someone today on this last. Give as was given to you in your need. Love as the master loved you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed. Unto your mission be true. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Amen. Great singing this evening. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kenny. Let's go ahead and get our Bibles out tonight. Find the book of 2 Thessalonians. We'll be in chapter 1 tonight. And uh, while you're finding that, uh, we got our new Bibles in, okay? And uh, they're in the bookstore. Uh, they can't, we, we ordered them in boxes so we can keep them neater and uh, kind of keep them together. And uh, the prices, that's what it cost us. That's at our cost. We don't make any money on them. And uh, that includes the, the shipping and everything. And so uh, I think most of them, at least many of them, are red letter editions, and uh, they're all calfskin Bibles, okay? They're nice leather Bibles, good bindings. And uh, Miss Hope uh, is going to be working in the bookstore. I think Donna helps in the bookstore as well. And uh, so we ask that you not self-serve, okay? Uh, go back there, and Miss Hope will get them off the shelf and let you look through them. And if you need a new Bible, this is the place to get them. Of course, they're, they're all King James, amen? And, uh, you know, they're, they're great covers, great bindings. Uh, the Bible I've got, uh, ordered this through local uh, church publishers. This is Bible pub uh, church publishers, uh, which is a spinoff from them, and uh, the same quality Bible. So it's really nice. And uh, this Bible I have is really held up really, really well. Uh, there's some large print Bibles back there. Uh, with wide margins. I think uh, most of them are center column reference, and so uh, they're really, really nice. Brother Mitch, have you lost your Bible? Have you lost your Bible? No, I have it at home. Okay, because I found the Bible back there. It looks like your handwriting in it, okay? So it's it's on the counter. You might want to take a look at it. It's a black one. I have one. Mine's at home. I know where it is. Okay, you know where it's at. All right. There's a really nice Bible sitting there. I have no idea who it belongs to, and I thought it might be yours. So if you lost one, we have a Lost and Founds in the bookstore, and there's some other nice Bibles in there. And they're too expensive to lose. Amen. Amen. And by the way, if you lost your Bible, shouldn't you notice it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you should notice that. Let's get our Bibles out tonight. Second Thessalonians. We finished... Uh, First Thessalonians a couple of weeks ago, we started in Second Thessalonians. I think it's a natural progression. And uh, again, you can read through this book in about five to ten minutes. It's not very long. And uh, kind of it, this picks up where Paul left off in uh, First Thessalonians. And uh, this series, we're calling it Hope for the End Times. Hope for the End Times. Again, I think we all agree that we're living in the last days. Amen. Uh, if not, we ought to be very, very concerned. And, uh, you know, what the devil tries to do to us uh, all the time, especially in the last days, is to get us to think that our situation is hopeless. Have you ever felt in your, that whatever situation you're in, have you ever got to the point sometimes where you felt it's just hopeless? You ever gotten there? What do you want to do when you feel like it's hopeless? You just want to give up. You just throw, throw in the towel and quit, don't you? Um, I was watching a boxing match uh, uh, here last week, and I can't think of the guy's fury. He's this great big heavyweight. He's like six foot eight, weighs 270 pounds. He's a huge guy. And the guy he was fighting was like six, six, 250, these two behemoths in there. And uh, man, Fury began to whoop up on him and had him in the corner and was just pounding away. And this guy was taking it, but his corner threw in the towel. OK. And uh, when they did, guess what the referee did? Fight's over. Well, the, the boxer wanted to continue, but his, his corner said, no, he's getting beat up too bad. We don't want him to get hurt. And so the devil wants to discourage you so that you think your hope, the situation is hopeless, so that you throw in the towel and quit. And so uh, we've all been in that situation. I heard a, a, a sad uh, statistic uh, this last week. Uh, COVID 
killed about 25 young people in America, about 25 teenagers. Kids have a huge survival rate with them, like 99.9%, okay? Why they're getting vaccinated, I have no idea, okay? The vaccination, did you know last week in America, most more people died from the vaccination than died from COVID? Yeah, I mean, really. I mean, it's over 2,000 died from the vax, and uh, I think it's less than like 1,500 died from COVID itself. But um, only a handful of teenagers died from covid but during the COVID shutdown, hundreds of teenagers took their lives. Why? Because the COVID shutdown took away their hope, okay? And uh, you've heard me talk about the Office of Mes Medical Investigator, the friend I have, and he said, Jeff, suicide rates are up 35% because of COVID and um, because their hope got taken away. And um, we just did some uh, chaplain training on suicide. And uh, one thing that we learned is that people don't want to die. These people that take their lives, they don't want to die. Uh, they've just given up hope. Uh, they just want the pain. They want the hurt to end. And they think that's the only way out. And, and, and that's how the devil works mind games with us. And so if hard times come to America, uh, the devil's going to want us to think you just need to give up, throw in the towel, quit, you know, stop being a Christian and just kind of go along with things. That's what we don't want to do. And, uh, you know, we, we think, well, that will never happen in the United States of America, you know, the home of the brave and the land of the free. Well, maybe uh, it will, because have you heard what's going on in Canada? Uh, there's been almost 30 churches that have been torched and vandalized in the last couple of weeks. And you know what the response of the Canadian government is to this? And it's these Antifa types. You know what their response has been? Well, these churches had it coming to them because of all their past abuses. In other words, what are they telling these people to do? Just keep on doing it. Now, if they're doing it in Canada, the, these Antifa types, you think it might happen in America one day. And uh, the, the government response would probably be the same, at least from the federal government. And so uh, uh, we're living in difficult times. And Paul here is writing to give these persecuted uh, members of the church at Thessalonica uh, some hope. Because they don't want, he doesn't want them to quit. They don't need to stop witnessing. And, and the bottom line here is, and we're going to talk about tonight is this. They need to know that God will bring justice to all the wrongs that are going on in this, on in this world. Uh, God will bring justice to those who are guilty of persecuting Christians and the Lord's churches. God's going to do that. And, um, and God's going to do that because our God is our God a loving God? Yes. Absolutely. But is he also is he also a just God? Yes. Is he also a righteous God? Yes. And so God is is going to uh, uh, right the wrongs and the injustices in this world. And it's not just for Christians; it's for everybody else who suffered an injustice. But uh, we're talking about the injustices and the wrongs being committed against believers back then and have been going on since that time around the world and that may even come to America one day. And uh, sometimes we get to thinking that God will never right the wrong. You know, it's been 2000 years. When are you going to take care of this, Lord? Well, look in Genesis 18, verse number 25. And there it says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Is, is God the judge of all the earth? Yes. Is he going to do the right thing? Yes. Yeah. Can anybody stop him from doing the right thing? No, no he will do the right thing. Revelation 15, 15 verse number three, uh, the last book in the Bible, it says there, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. God is a just God, and he's going to right the wrongs. And because he is a just God, justice will be done one day is coming. We're going to see that tonight. Look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading, begin reading in verse number 5. And uh, let's back up to verse number 4 because it goes to, with, with verse number 5. And here Paul in verse 4 talks about the persecution they were doing, that they were enduring, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God 
to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when, not if, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall, not might, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When, not if, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified where? In you, not with you or for you, may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you're taking notes tonight, write down number one, uh, I want you to see the truth of God's justice, the truth of God's justice. And uh, go back to verse number five. And again, verse five is referring back to verse four, where Paul is talking about the persecutions and the tribulations that this church was enduring, the members of this church were going through. And he says, which is a manifest, manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Now, let me ask you a question tonight. Is suffering for the faith, for your faith in Jesus Christ, is suffering for the faith a good thing or a bad thing? How many say it's a bad thing? Anybody say it's a bad thing? How many would say it's a good thing? Okay, you're right. It's a good thing. And, uh, and, and there's some reasons why. Uh, look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 17. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 17. And uh, Peter writes here, and this goes with verse 5, for the time has come that judgment must begin. At where? The house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? See how that fits together? So God's going to judge everything, right? Is God going to judge us as well? Yeah. Now, we're not going to be judged like the lost, but we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ one day. Okay? So God's judgment is going to begin with Christians. It's going to begin with the house of God. Okay? Uh, look at verse 5 again, which is a manifest token of the judgment of God. He's saying what you're going through now is a picture, it's a token of, of the judgment that the unsaved are going to face one day. And you're going through it now because judgment has to begin first at the house of God. Now, when God judges the unbelievers, he's going to judge them to punish them, okay? We're going to see, he's going to take uh, fiery flaming vengeance on them. But when God judges us, we're saved, amen? We've been saved from wrath to come. When God allows judgment to come to us, suffering, that is God's way of purifying us, okay? Look at that verse again, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. Why? That you may be counted what? Worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. And so this suffering that we face is a purifying thing. And if God is going to judge believers, that means he's also going to judge who? Unbelievers, amen? Amen. He's going to judge them as well. And uh, we often think sometimes when we're going through these trials and tribulations and suffering that God is absent from us. Where's God at? Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I had a man I talked to here a couple of weeks ago. It's like, where's God at in all this that I'm going through right now? And uh, I told him, I said, look, uh, you go outside on a cloudy day, dark clouds, maybe rain is falling and you can't see the sun. Does that mean the sun's not there? Is the sun still there? Yes. Yeah, but you're just not seeing the sunshine, okay? When the clouds go away, guess what? The sunshine is going to come down, amen? And so sometimes we think, well, well, where's God at? Well, when you're going through suffering and tribulation, guess where God is at? He's right there with you. 
He's right there with you. He promised that he would never leave you nor forsake you. Is God aware of what you're going through? Yes. yes. In fact, is God allowing what you're going through? God is allowing it for a greater good in order to purify us. And that is a good thing to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, this gentleman I was talking to, he's not a member. And uh, I said, you know what? These things that you're going through right now, how about if you turn that inside out and say, you know what I'm going through right now? I'm going to let God use that to develop within me the character of Christ. What is the character of Christ? The, the, is the love of Jesus conditional or unconditional? Yeah. Uh, does, does Jesus give up on us or is he long suffering? Yeah. So let, let God use these things to develop the character of Christ in you, to make you more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Did Jesus suffer for us? Yeah. Did Jesus quit? Did he throw in the towel? Was there, did God allow the suffering? Yeah, it was God's will. Okay. And God used it for a greater good. And so uh, when we think about the, this judgment and, and the judgment of the unsaved, uh, we read about it. Look in verse number eight and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Now, uh, a, 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 a lot of people, uh, maybe you've heard this. Well, I just can't believe that a loving God would send anyone to hell. OK, I just can't believe that a loving God uh, would bring that type of judgment against somebody. And you see, the problem they have is that there's two things they don't understand. The holiness of God and, and the awfulness of sin in God's sight. OK, they don't understand the character of God. They don't understand the, the true nature of sin. And the, but the Bible does tell us, look in verse six that God, uh, our loving God, will judge sin and unbelievers. Look what it says. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Paul says when God judges those who are persecuting you, it will be done in righteousness. It is the right thing to do. Uh, I was uh, watch. Uh, I don't watch the news. Uh, I guess I was looking at a website somewhere. Maybe you've seen this too. Um, out in California now, in a lot of places, if you shoplift or steal something under a thousand dollars, guess what? I, I don't know. I've heard here, Dennis, that's two hundred and fifty dollars. Is that true? A thousand is the felony charge. Under a thousand is misdemeanor. Just a misdemeanor. Okay, are they even arresting people for it anymore? Are they citing them? They're citing them. I think in California, they don't even cite them. So guess what's happening now in California? Uh, I, I, saw, I saw a video of this woman. She's at a stoplight, and this guy's robbing her at the stoplight in broad daylight. Why? Because there's no threat of any penalty. Now, is that just? Is it wrong to steal? Yeah, God says, thou shalt not steal. You're taking somebody's property. Remember, we preached about property on the 4th of July. Remember that? That's a basic freedom, you know. And and uh, and so they're not being cited. They're not being arrested. They're just free. And uh, what was it? Nordstrom and some of these other major department stores out there are closing down because they have so much shoplifting going on. They're stealing them blind. And, uh, you know, if we're going to make that the law where it's okay to do that, then I have a proposal that needs to be added to the law. The front and back doors need to be removed from the homes of every judge in California. Amen. Along with the mayors and all the city councilors. Amen. I mean, if it's okay to steal. Amen. Uh, when my dad, my dad used to be, uh, he was in the real estate business and he managed some property. And uh, it's really difficult to get people evicted out of a property if they're not paying their rent. And so my dad always had it in the contract that he was free at any time to do uh, remodeling or improvements on the property. And uh, if they had not paid their rent and he couldn't get them out of the house, then he would come and remodel the house by taking the front and back doors off the house. He said, you know, it's funny. Every, every, every time I did that, the next day they were gone. <laughs> Down in South Florida, you better be gone. Amen. And uh, that was a long time ago. And so I think it'd be a great idea to just take the doors off their houses. What do you think? How many would vote for that law? Okay. Yeah. 
And so if you don't let them rob me, then we're going to make it easier for them to rob you, okay, if you think it's okay. Well, God is a just God, and because of that, he must judge all sin, and all sin must be accounted for. Now, listen, all sin must be judged and accounted for either on the cross of Christ or in hell for all eternity. All right? So all has to be accounted for. It all has to be paid for. And, uh, you know, in a sin-crazy, gospel-hating, Christian-hating world, uh, that ought to give all believers a great hope. God will judge all sin. It all must be accounted for. Uh, every wrong must be righted. Justice must be done. And uh, for those who have slaughtered and persecuted our, our uh, Christian brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we can be assured that God's judgment is coming for them one day. Amen. They're not going to get away with that. And uh, I want you to notice, look in verse number six, underline that word recompense. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. That word recompense means to pay back in kind. Pay back in kind. God is going to pay them back for us one day. And so uh, this is a, a great truth about God's justice. It's a great promise and it's a great hope uh, that, that would help us if we have to go through this in America. Look in Psalm 27 and verse number 13. And we're talking about hope for the last days. And uh, the fact that, that God will not allow justice to go unpunished uh, ought to be a great blessing to us. In Psalm 27, verse 13, uh, David wrote this. He said, I had fainted. I had fainted. I would I'd have given up. I would have thrown in the towel. I had fainted unless I would believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And uh, David was looking forward to that time when God would make all things right. And so if and when persecution comes to America, uh, we can take great comfort in knowing that God uh, will hold our persecutors accountable and justice will prevail. The truth of God's justice. Now, look at verse number seven. Here I want you to see the timing of God's justice, the timing of God's justice. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When, not if, when the Lord Jesus shall, not might, be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And so uh, we, we have the answer to the timing of God's justice. It's going to happen when Jesus is revealed. Now, have Christians down through the ages been wondering when God's justice is going to come against the evildoers? Yeah. Um, in Psalm 13, write that down. There are several times in that psalm, uh, the question is asked, how long, O oh Lord? How long? How long are you going to wait, Lord? How long is it going to be until justice comes? Lord, how long is it going to be until you make things right? And, uh, oh, how long, O oh Lord? And then in Revelation chapter 6, there we have a heavenly scene with the martyrs, those who have been killed for the faith, and they're before the throne of God. And here's what they're asking. How long, O Lord? They're repeating Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And so uh, this is the age old question. And uh, look over in second. Well, look at verse, uh, verse number seven again. Here we see the answer. When's God going to take justice? when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, what that's talking about is the second coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. And uh, remember now, uh, we, the second coming involves two parts. There's the rapture at the beginning of the tribulation. When we meet the Lord in the air, he comes for his saints. And then we have that seven-year tribulation period. And Jesus comes back out of heaven with his saints we call theologians call that the revelation. Look at verse six again, uh, verse seven, rather, uh, uh, when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven. Uh, when Jesus comes at the rapture, is the world going to see him? Yeah. No. What, the rapture? Not, not the rapture. It's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Boom. Just that fast. We're going to meet him in the air. Okay. We're going to go up. 
The dead in Christ shall rise first, okay? We're going to receive our glorified bodies. We're going back to heaven. But when he comes back at the revelation, will the world see him then? Yes. yes. And the Bible tells us that it's going to frighten the unsaved so much, they're going to be begging for the mountains to come down on top of them, okay? Uh, they know that God's judgment is coming. And so if you want to get a picture of what it's going to be like when he comes at the revelation at the end of the tribulation period, look in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Guess who that is? Jesus. That's Jesus. Amen. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. He's not coming back as the meek and lowly Lamb of God. Amen. He's coming back as a roaring lion. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. But, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven, guess who that is? That's the saved. Amen. We're coming with him. Followed, upon, uh, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And all God's people said, Amen. I think we all say praise the Lord. Amen. And so he's coming back. And uh, that's when this judgment of the unsaved world is going to take place. And, uh, and uh, it says uh, 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 who he's going to take vengeance on. Look at verse number eight. Who's he going to take this vengeance on? And flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some people think, well, that's two different groups of people. That's not what it means, okay? We're just talking about this. If you don't know God, it's because you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? You've not been saved. Are you all awake tonight? Okay. Uh, you're, 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 you're not saved. Uh, 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 you, you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ. And look over in Acts chapter 17. Do you know that God commands us to repent and to believe the gospel? And if you haven't done that, you're disobeying the gospel. If you're here tonight and you've never repented of your sins and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are disobeying God, okay? And look in Acts chapter 17 and verse number 30. And was when Paul was in Athens up on Mars Hill preaching to those Athenians, and he said to them, And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to what? Repent. To repent. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. And if you don't obey that command to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are guilty of disobeying the gospel. And when Jesus comes again, you're the ones going to be subject to that flaming, fiery vengeance of God. And uh, that word vengeance, underline that in your Bibles, that word means inflicting full judgment and punishment on evil. Full and complete. It's, it's the idea of a criminal getting exactly what he deserves. No more, no less. God's justice will be righteous. And, uh, and uh, those who reject Jesus Christ, uh, they're, they're going to suffer the wrath of God because of it. Look in verse number nine. Here's what it will be. Who shall be punished with everlasting what? Destruction. Destruction. Now, how many ever heard of the seven-day Adventist? Anybody get one of their books in the mail this week besides me? I got a hardcover book of Ellen G. White's book in the mail. Some guy back east mailed it to me. I don't know why. It's probably a $20 book. And uh, it's called uh, uh, The Great Controversy. Ellen G. White wrote that book. She was the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. By the way, if you have a human founder, can it be a church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Can't be, Okay. And she's not, she was a heretic, okay? And here's one reason why. Seventh-day Adventists believe that if you're not saved, that you're annihilated, you no longer exist. You just go out of existence. Jehovah's Witnesses believe the same thing, another cult, 
Okay, that's not what this is telling us here. Uh, God breathed into man the breath of life and he became a living soul. We all have an eternal soul. Okay, Uh, it will never, ever stop existing. Well, what does it mean to be punished uh, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord? Well, it means the loss of everything that makes existence meaningful. If you die and go to hell. You're going to lose your freedom. You're going to lose your family. You're going to lose all of your friends. I got news for you. Hell's not going to be a party place. Amen. Well, I don't mind going to hell. It'll be party time for us. Me and all my buddies, we'll be drinking and sexing. We're going to be doing everything. No, you won't. Uh, pl- hell's a place of outer darkness. It's a bottomless pit. Okay. And just like you're separated from God forever, you're separated from other human beings forever. It's an eternal uh, isolation cell, if you please, while you're burning in the flames at the same time. Now, I, I, I wish I didn't have to tell you that, but that's what the Bible says. Well, that's just not very loving, preacher. Well, uh, Jesus was the most loving, compassionate person who ever lived. Amen. And he had more to say about hell than he had to say about heaven. You know why? Because he doesn't want you to go there. That's, right. That's why he came and died on the cross for you. Okay? If you die, if you die and go to hell, it's your fault, not his fault. Amen. And so uh, loss of freedom, loss of family, loss of friends, loss of pleasure, and worst of all, the loss of God. And this everlasting destruction means eternal separation from God. Look back in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20 talks about this great loss, this this everlasting destruction. And uh, think about it. In heaven, aren't we going to get to enjoy the presence of God forever? Yeah. But you know what hell and the lake of fire is going to be? That's going to be uh, uh, suffering the absence of God forever. Suffering the absence of God forever. And uh, look at verse number 11 of Revelation 20. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. In other words, no place to hide. There's no bushes. There's no trees. There's no buildings. You can't run and, you know, pull a cover over your head. Okay. And I saw the the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The book of life is where the names of the saved are recorded. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged how many? Every man. Nobody's going to escape according to their works. And uh, part of that works, you know, the main work there is whether or not <clears throat> you obey God in repenting and trusting Christ for salvation. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is what? <clears throat> the second death. Death is a separation. Okay? The soul separates from the body. The second death is when your soul is separated from God forever and the lake of fire. Look at verse 15. And whosoever is not found written in the book of life, if you weren't saved, you hadn't repented, you hadn't trusted Christ, was cast into the lake of fire. Guess how long that's going to last? Forever. Yeah. The Bible says the, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. That's an awful thought, isn't it? Awful thought. Awful thought. But here's what you need to remember. People don't go to hell because God rejected them. That's right. People go to hell because they rejected God. That's right. If you die and go to hell... It's not God's fault. Guess whose fault it is? It's your fault. Jesus came and died so you could be saved. Jesus came and died so you would not have to go there. He suffered the punishment for your sins. Remember, every sin has to be accounted for, either on the cross or in hell. It's what the Bible says. You get to make the choice. You get to make that choice. Now, let me ask you something. We're talking about persecuted Christians. Is God going to take vengeance against them? Should we rejoice over that or should we grieve over it? We ought to grieve over it. It's not like, oh boy, they're going to get it. Yeah, burn them up, God. No. 
We ought to grieve over that because, listen, but for the grace of God, that would be you and I. That's right. And here's what it ought to do. It ought to motivate us to be greater witnesses to them. You know, if we come to the place of persecution, you know what the best thing you can do when you stand before your persecutors? It's tell them about Jesus. Amen. Tell them about the Lord. Tell them how to be saved. Preach the gospel to them. Well, they might kill me. Well, they're just going to send you to heaven. Amen. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Now look at verse number 10. Let's go back. We got to hurry. It says, when he shall be, when he shall come to be glorified, where? In his saints. And so much to the dismay of our enemies, when Jesus comes back, listen to me, we are going to share in his glory. Now, I don't have time to look it up, but write down Romans chapter 8, verses 17 and verses 28 through 30. Uh, we're we're going to be glorified in the Lord Jesus. The Jesus Christ is going to be glorified in us to the chagrin of our enemies. Now, uh, here's the idea as I was studying about this. Uh, we have LED lights right now, but remember the old light bulbs that had the little squiggly thing in them? What do they call that little squiggly thing? Filament, okay? And what was it that made it glow? What did you have to do to that bulb? Yeah, screw it in. He also had to do what? And when you flip the switch, what happened? Electricity. Electricity went up through that filament and made that filament glow. That filament went glowing on its own, okay? It was what? The electricity in it, okay? And so is Jesus, does Jesus Christ exist within you, with all, within all the saved tonight? Yes. And so this glorification, it's not uh, us, our glory, it's his glory. Where? In us. Did you get that? It's not your glory, it's his glory. It's his glory. Uh, we're we're going to be share in the glory of Christ at his coming. Well, let's hurry up and finish here tonight. Look at the third thing. Lastly, I want you to see the thrill of God's justice. The thrill of God's justice. Look at verses 11 and 12. Now, we talk about Christ being glorified in you. Do we have to wait until Jesus comes for that to happen? When should that be happening? Right now. Can it happen right now? Yeah, we, we don't have to wait till Jesus comes. Uh, it ought to happen right now. Look at verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling uh, to, to have Christ glorified in you and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be what? Glorified in you. And ye in him, according to the what? Grace. Grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And look up here for a minute. In that last verse, God connects a uh, 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 glorifying Jesus with the grace of God. Okay. How many of you have been saved by the grace of God? Okay. You've been saved by the grace of God. Therefore, who should be glorified in your life? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God puts those together. God puts those together. And uh, if you've been saved by the grace of God, then your life should be bringing glory to him. And if God's going to be glorified in us for all eternity, then he should also be glorified in us right now. Amen. Today, tomorrow, and every day of our life on this earth. Now, listen to me very carefully. Let me help you out tonight. You know, part of my job as your pastor is to admonish you. Amen. You know what I see that destroys uh, 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 Christ being glorified in Christians? Pride. Pride. Does God hate pride? Yes. The Bible says in, 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 in uh, Proverbs 6, God hates pride. God hates pride. You know why? Because when you're prideful, you walk around glorifying yourself instead of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, you ever seen Christians do that? You know, we get these super self-righteous, pious gas bags who think they're more spiritual than anybody else. Amen. In the church and the world, I, I have more I have more contact with God than you have. Well, maybe you do, but I wouldn't run around bragging about it. Amen. Because there's nothing godly about pride. God hates pride. Uh, people who think they have superior spirituality and greater Bible knowledge. You know, when you walk around with that type of attitude, you're not glorifying Jesus Christ. You're glorifying yourself. Amen? 
And I want to tell you something. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Amen. You're robbing Jesus of his glory. Remember we talked about Peter up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah. What was his harebrained idea? Let's build three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and Elijah. Now, did Jesus give that a thumbs up or a thumbs down? I don't share my glory with anybody. Amen. I don't share my glory with anybody. And uh, the Apostle Paul, if any man had reason to glory, he did. And he talked about that. You know, he had the education. He had the background. But look what Paul said. Look in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number, verse number 10. Paul had it right. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Did you get that? If I'm anything, it's only by what? The grace of God. The grace of God. Uh, he gave God all the glory for who and what he was. And he didn't stop there. Look in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 31. And there he wrote that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Put a sock in it. Amen. Put a sock in it. Brother Ted, do you remember in Bible college we had pious gas bags? Yeah, I think it was Noel Smith that came up with that term. Pious gas bag. Noel Smith was an old professor. He was like 120 years old then, okay? And, uh, you know, he had these uh, big, white, eye, bushy eyebrows. Looked like an owl looking at you, you know? And we had him for, uh, I think it was hermeneutics, okay? And, uh, you know, we, we, I still got the book. We, he would assign portions of that book for us to read. He was from Kentucky. He was an old Kentucky Baptist preacher, and he had assigned these portions. Now, your assignment for the next class is to read chapter so-and-so, and when you get here, we'll call on people to stand and recite. And you'd go to class, and you're like, I hope he doesn't call me to stand and recite, because I haven't read chapter so-and-so. Amen? <laughs> and uh, I remember one of my, one of my, my buddy, Chuck Doan, his fiance, uh, he called on his fiance to stand and recite one time, uh, Kathy. And uh, she stood up and she just started shaking and crying. It's like, what's wrong with you? Just sit down. OK. And he called on somebody else. But he talked about pious gas bags. And, you know, uh, one, one of the places that's most full of pious gas bags in, in Bible college. OK. You got these young theologues, he called them, these young theologues. And uh, they've had a semester of Greek and they think they can interpret the Greek, Koine Greek. OK. And uh, they're so spiritual. But uh, Paul says, we're going to glory, glory in the Lord. And here's why. Look at James 4, verse number 6. Here's why. God resisteth the proud. Amen. God's going to do this. You're not going to grow. You're not going to go. He's not going to use you. Okay. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to who? The humble. When you see yourself like God sees you. OK, now Christians have and will continue to suffer a lot of injustices in this world. Amen. It's going on tonight. There are Christians in prison. There are Christians being executed. We've got it really easy. You know, we think suffering for Jesus is somebody saying, no, I don't, they won't take the track you offer them. OK. Or they tell you, no, I won't come to your church. We think we're suffering for Jesus. And um you know what God wants us to do? If it comes to us and we have to start going through that stuff, you know what God wants us to do while we're going through it? Wait. Wait on him because what's he going to do? Is he going to execute justice? Is he going to execute judgment? It's like, just wait. Just hold on. That's what he's telling these Thessalonians. Hold on. When he comes, he's going to take vengeance, flaming fiery vengeance on these. Now, as much as we suffer in this world as Christians, has any Christian ever suffered as much as the Lord Jesus Christ? No. no. The Bible says his visage was marred more than any man. Nobody suffered like Jesus suffered. And yet the Bible says he opened not his mouth. You know why? Because he was waiting on the Lord. Think about it. They brutally nailed him to a cross, drove a spear up into his heart. Let the blood rush out of his body. And there he gave up the ghost and shed his blood and died as payment for our sins. And they put his body in a grave. And the devil thought, finally got him. Finally got him. Day one went by. Day two went by. Day three went by. And what happened on the third day? 
He arose from the dead. Amen. He knew what it meant to wait on the Lord. And so if tribulation and persecution and even death comes to us in America as believers, what do we need to do? Just wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Now, waiting on the Lord doesn't mean, you know, uh, if you go to a restaurant, they have people that come out and take your order. What, what do they call those? Servers. Waiters or waitresses? Servers. Servers. Okay. Is that the politically correct term? Okay. So while we're waiting on the Lord, what should we also be doing? Serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. Amen. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep on serving Jesus till he comes again. Let's bow our heads in prayer tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed in prayer. I don't know about you. I needed this. I needed this. It encouraged me. It helped me. It strengthened me. Anybody else here tonight with heads bowed and eyes, and clo eyes closed? No one looking around. Don't be a peeping Tom. Anybody else? Would you lift your hands to Brother Carl? I needed this message tonight. That helped me. Anybody? I needed it. I needed it. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, help us to humbly serve you until Jesus comes. Lord, I pray that uh, we never see real persecution come to America. Uh, but, Lord, it might. It's already taken place in Canada, Lord. They're burning churches down and the government's standing back and, and from all intents and purposes, are encouraging it. And, uh, Lord, we have some of the same type of crazy leaders in this country, Lord, the same philosophy. They're communists. They hate Christianity. They hate Christians. And, uh, Lord, it could come to America. And, Father, if it does, uh, Lord, help us to remember what we've seen here tonight, uh, the truth of your justice. You will come one day and take fiery vengeance on the enemies of God's people and the enemies of God's churches. And uh, Lord, in the meantime, if Lord, if we're going through that, uh, Lord, help us to be like Jesus who suffered more than anybody's ever suffered. And uh, Lord, not to scream for our rights, not to cry out injustice, but Lord, just to keep our mouth shut and to wait for you like Jesus did. And uh, Lord, the day is coming when uh, your people will be vindicated and vengeance will be taken on the evildoers. And Father, I pray tonight if there's anybody here who's not saved, Lord, they've never obeyed your command to repent and to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, they need to do that tonight in this service before they leave this building. Uh, Lord, your judgment is, the Bible says it hovers over them. It's just waiting to fall. It's only by your grace that it hasn't fallen. And Father, help us to understand uh, when people die and go to hell, it's not because you rejected them. It's because they have rejected you and your son, Jesus. Nobody has to go to hell. You want everyone to be saved. You said in your word that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight who's not saved, may they see their lost condition tonight. And uh, may they repent of their sin before you and cry out to Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. Lord, help them to do that tonight. Father, if we're guilty of being prideful and, uh, Lord, glorifying ourselves and bragging about how spiritual we are, how much Bible knowledge we have, God, help us to repent of that wicked attitude. And, uh, Lord, to humble ourselves before you and say, God, forgive me. God, help me. And uh, help me only to glory in you, Jesus. All glory and power belong to you alone. Father, uh, work now as we get on our knees and pray. And we pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to, everybody's got your prayer list tonight. Okay. Uh, let's pray for the appreciation day. If you would put that at the top of your list, pray we'll get a good response from the officers. Continue praying for Miss Amy. And uh, we've been in a drought. We had a young man saved at camp last week. Thank God for that. But we want to see people saved every, every week. Amen. In church, out of church. So pray God to give us souls. Do your part by being a witness and inviting people to come. Okay. Who needs a, a prayer partner tonight? Anybody need a prayer partner? All right. Brother Sean needs a prayer partner. I'm going to be praying with my wife. Anybody need anyone? Can he pray with some of you men? Some of you men? I'm fine by myself. Okay. All right, Miss Amy, uh, yes, ma'am, Miss Lori, she needs a partner. Any of you ladies? Okay. Well, 
uh, welcome them into your group, if you would, please. Okay, let's go ahead and get on our knees and pray. I have the last two weeks. This is nobody else to party with. It's okay. <clears throat> it's not true. Hmm. My nose is running. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the message tonight. And uh, Lord,
Let's all stand one more time tonight. Number 419. We'll sing the first and last verse of the solid rock. We're right, right along the message tonight. Number 419 on the first and last. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. I not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Well, I'm glad I came tonight. You're glad you came. Amen. 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 It's good to have you here. Anybody want to look at Bibles tonight? Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Right, right there. Okay. Miss Hope. Can you take care of her? All right, show those Bibles to her. We got large print. I don't know if you need large print. Yeah, you do? 
Okay, we got it. We got it. Okay, big ones and little ones. All right. All right. Am I not turned on? No. Yeah, I'm turned on. Well, he's I'm muted back, back there. there in the back. There you go. There you go. Got it. So, uh, yeah, we'll take care of that tonight. If anybody else wants to look at them. Okay, let's bow our heads in prayer. Uh, fellas, don't forget the uh, men's Bible study Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. That, you guys have been coming. Is it worth coming to? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's been awesome. It's been great. It really has. I've enjoyed it. And uh, so be sure to come and try to bring somebody with you. And then let's pray for a good day Sunday. Hopefully we'll start getting people back and the tennis goes up. And let's pray we'll see somebody get saved Sunday, okay? Pray we'll see someone come to Christ for salvation. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for uh, your word tonight, Lord. Thank you for the promise of your coming. Uh, Lord, thank you for the promise that uh, justice will be done one day, Lord. We just need to wait on you. Uh, Lord, so often we see criminals and it appears that they get away with so much evil and crime and wrongdoing. And uh, they escape uh, human justice. But, Lord, they're not going to escape yours. And, uh, Father, we've seen Christians uh, uh, being persecuted, Lord, by the millions over the years. And, uh, Lord, sometimes we wonder, will justice ever be done? And the answer is yes. It will happen when Jesus comes again. And, Father, again, I pray if there's any here tonight who have never obeyed your command to repent and to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they would do so, Father. Uh, Lord, I, I don't want anybody to die and go to hell. You don't want anyone to die and go to hell. That's why you gave your son to die for us. And, uh, Father, it's a tragedy when anybody uh, dies and goes to hell forever when they do not have to. And so, Lord, help them to come to you tonight for salvation. And, Lord, Father, we pray and ask all these things in the name of your dear son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you and have a great evening.